it's about sodium disturbance and sodium problem in patients with hemodialysis. The problem in sodium is that it's not just sodium leading to natural but the relation between sodium and the water in the body is very So sodium is responsible, as we will see in the next few slides, is responsible for keeping the extra silver fluid going and keeping the balance between fluid in different parts of the world. Why natremia? Because well, the name means sodium, but it is related more to water from So natremia is a water problem, and sodium as an amount is a volume problem, as we see. This just show you how to This show you, this cartoon show you the different compartment of fluids in the body. The largest compartment is the intracellular compartment, which constitutes two thirds of the body water, it's forty percent of the body weight. While the extracellular constitutes only one third of that. One quarter is in the circulation and three quarter between the cells, what we call interstitial fluid, which constitutes only 15% of the body weight, while plasma and intravascular volume constitutes 5% of the body weight. The volume, although it's not that much, the circulation in the vessels is very important moves the nutrients from different, part, from different parts of the body to the target organs, the target cells in fraction of a second. While it is in, not in direct connection with the cell, there is an intermediate fluid called interstitial fluid between the cell. This interstitial fluid is very important because it carries the nutrient and waste products to and from the cells, to and from the vessel. And there is a great difference in composition of the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. The difference lies in many molecules, actually. And if you look carefully at this slide, you will find on the top here, sodium constitutes the major cation in the ECF extracellular while potassium constitutes the major cation inside the cell. So, if you look at the, at the relation of the difference between the sodium as a cation outside the cell and the molar concentration of other cations, you find sodium is a major. None of the other cations approaches even one tenth of the sodium concentration. But don't be fooled by the milligram per deciliter of glucose or amino acids. Because this does not speak the truth. Because when you tell, you have to tell about the molar concentration, which is milli equivalent or millimole per liter. So if you change glucose to millimole, it is only five millimole per liter. So the difference is great, actually. This means that the sodium is the major controller of the concentration outside the cell while the potassium is a main contributor to the molar uh, uh, solute concentration inside the cell. So this is the molecular weight of the important electrolytes that we make use of in many cases sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, atomic weight, valency, and 
this is sodium 23 delta with univalence or monovalence and its concentration in blood as I said 140 milligram per liter which equals 3 to 2 milligram per deciliter. We usually utilize the, the molar concentration, not the mass concentration for dealing with the electrolytes. This is because the fact, which is called osmosis, this is a phenomenon that governs water movement. Movement of water across the membrane from a solution of lower concentration to a solution of higher concentration. And what controls osmosis actually is the molar concentration, not the ground concentration of any solutions. So osmosis outside the cell will depend mainly on, huh? on sodium. And osmosis inside the cell will depend mainly on potassium and others. So sodium is a major player of osmosis and osmolality outside the cell. The osmotic activity depends on the number, as I said, not on the mass. And if the molecule dissociates like sodium chloride, it will yield on two osmos rather than one osmo. And we change every molecule that we, we need to know the accountability of it to the uh, osmolality, we change it into the molar concentration as glucose we divide on 18, BUN we divide on 2.8, and we can conclude easily that glucose is of lower molar concentration in the ECF, which is only 5 by maximum or 6, while BUN is also low. So, tonicity or the power of ECF depends mainly on the sodium. And we multiply it by two to approach the originality to account for the accompanying anions. So sodium as a cation, there should be a, a, a accompanying anions, and both can be accounted for by timing sodium by two. So we have the phenomenon of tonicity, which is dependent mainly on sodium glucose, or sometimes we can use sodium alone, but this controls the movement of fluid across the cell membrane because the cell membrane is not diffusible easily, diffusing easily to sodium or potassium. But the capillary membrane between the capillaries and the interstitial is different. It easily allows these small molecules to pass through. So these small molecules like sodium, potassium, glucose, amino acids, and even other larger molecules may not exhibit any effective water shifting properties across the capillary membrane. Although sodium is a major across a cell membrane, but it is not of any role played against water movement across the capillary wall. But what plays a role in the capillaries is plasma proteins because they don't diffuse through the capillary wall. This is why this amount of power or pressure is termed on contact pressure. It is accounted for by the plasma protein and it determines the movement of water between the intravascular and the rest of the interstitial fluids. So when I see a patient with decreased albumin, he might have movement of water from the plasma to the interstitial. So I find this patient edematous, the expansion of the interstitial fluid. But the plasma volume actually might decrease. But this is not the case in every condition. Sometimes the body reflexes can react to that and allow for intense salt and water retention to refill the plasma again. So you might end up by expanding the ECF a lot, the interstitial fluid, while the plasma volume remains not much expanded. 
Now it depends on how intense the sodium and the water retention will be. This just explains that inside the cells, inside the cell, potassium is a major player for osmosis, and outside the cell, sodium is the major player. But glucose might be of some role in case of diabetes, meaning the splinter is much hyperglycemic, and this plays against the cell. So there is a balance between potassium and others inside and sodium and others outside. And this keeps this balance keeps the, the distribution of volume of the cells and the ECF. But here in the vessel wall, the problem is different because it admits sodium will cause potassium and whatever of the small nuclear easily, but Proteins are restricted inside the plasma. So the balance between the plasma and the interstitium is dependent on the presence of plasma proteins inside our plasma. This is a nice experiment when we get a cell like that with certain Osmotic activity and size accounted for, for example, by potassium, and inserted in a container, a fluid container, containing isoosmal amount of fluid, so the osmolality outside equals the osmolality inside. So the net result is the movement from out in will equal to the movement from in out. And there is a balance and no change of volume as a net result. And you can do that by putting it into an isoosmal solution containing something like normal saline. So no change in volume. But if you place the same cell in a stronger solution that contains hypertonic sodium, like an osmolality of 360 milliosmol per liter you will notice that the cell shrinks. This due to extrusion of water by osmosis from the weaker inside to the stronger relatively outside. So the cell shrinks and the cell is our target and life is present inside the cell. So if the cell is hurt or injured or changed, then the integrity of the organism is changing as a whole. On the other way around, if you put such a cell in a high plutonic solution containing less sodium concentration than the isotonic, like this with 200 milliosmol per liter, you will note that that water will travel quickly inside the cell and the cell keeps swelling until there is equilibrium between the pressures outside and the pressure inside. If the pressure outside is too low, then the cell keeps swelling, keeps enlarging until even eventually it might rupture, cause the loss of the cell and its contents. And this actually is the basis of some tests that we make use of in testing blood for a condition like spherocytosis when we expose the RBCs to diluted media. And at what point, when the dilution is too much, the cell corruption and we get hypnosis. So whenever we go and see a patient, we diagnose two sets of diagnoses. We make first diagnosis a concentration diagnosis that we call water diagnosis. And we see whether there is water excess, water deficit or normal water concentration. So the concentration is dependent on water, because water is the solvent. But another set of diagnosis is the sodium diagnosis. Sodium diagnosis is dependent on the amount of sodium inside our body. And this depends, and this depicts or, or uh, uh, determines our volume. So the more we get sodium inside our body, whatever the concentration is, 
we become hyper and hyperbolic. And it is the role of the kidney to adjust to both of these things. Kidney works to adjust water by excreting free water or retaining free water. And this is with the help of the antidiotic hormone and other hormones. But also the kidney is very effective in excreting or retaining a load of sodium or a deficient sodium load. So the kidney can play around and control any change that might happen both in the osmolality and in our body. But if the kidney is not working properly, there might be deficiency in one or both of these functions. We can't lose the ability to correct water load with high osmolality or water deficit with high osmolality. And we might find it difficult to get rid of a sodium load or to deal with a case with a sodium deficient state. So the kidney is very important here, and this is the most important organ dealing with such thing. In health of the kidney is the hypothalamus, the thirst center. Because you feel thirsty when you are hyperosmos, you go and drink, and you feel not thirsty at all and you fill up with water if you are hypoosmolar. And you feel like eating salt if you are a bit hypovolemic, and you feel hating salt if you are hypervolemic. But this is not very accurate. So you find a lot of people with good disease walking around with hypervolemic because the mechanism in the kidney and in the appetite is not very well adjusted in this case. <coughs> In the normal life, we should have balance between the intake of fluid, water and other fluids, and output. And the intake should equal the output exactly. And whenever we secrete any secretion from our body, this secretion will contain water, which is the liter here. This is water, and this is the amount in milling equivalent in each secretion from the stomach, duodenum, jejunum, bile, pancreas, colon, and even sweat. If we take in consideration that sodium concentration in the blood is 140, you can observe easily that none of the secretion is hypertonic. The secretions are or is a isotonic, like those in the middle, or hypotonic, like those in the periphery and in the sweat. So if you are losing hypotonic solution, then you are losing water more than sodium. So the major problem will be that you will be hypertonic. You will be hyperosmotic, but this really occurs because you will feel thirsty and water is available everywhere. You can easily ask somebody to give you a cup of water or a glass of water and you will feel satisfied after that. However, many patients with disease in the kidneys, disease in the endocrine system or disease in the circulatory system might have volume problems, like volume overload cases and the manifestation are easily depicted as edema, which shows you interstitial expansion, congested neck veins, which should mean intravascular expansion, basal pulmonary rods means left-sided intravascular expansion complicated by static pulmonary edema. Hypertension is a combination between intravascular expansion and maybe sometimes possible restriction. Puffy eyes, interstitial, and this thing is like. And there are many causes, and if you can notice, the causes are related to sodium and accompanying water. So hypervolemia is a sodium problem. So whenever you consume a lot of sodium, if the kidney is not to execute this load, you will have 
mainly hyperbolemia and not hypernatremia, as you might think. So you might not be able to excrete load, or in, in very infrequent cases, you might consume excess intake of salt. On the opposite direction, volume contraction, which occur when you lose a lot, and the manifestation is reverse, dry skin, loss of skin, turban, sunken eyes, empty neck veins, which is vascular depletion, rapid pulse, hypertension, decreased consciousness, pneumonia, postural changes of blood pressure. And the causes is either increased loss or decreased intake of salt, mainly salt. But if you increase the intake of water, it's not a volume problem, it's a natremia problem or osmolality problem. If you decrease intake of water, the result is hypernatremia or hyperosmolality. So water intake and water loss determines the osmolality in your body, not the volume, as you might think. But sodium intake and sodium loss determine the volume of your ECM. And hypolatremia may be classified, hypovolemia, sorry, may be classified to mild, moderate, severe according to the amount of loss. But the severest form is leading to shock with a pending test. So in CKD, there is usually a tendency for sodium retention, especially in the disease, but early in the disease it might be sodium waste. So salt losing tubulopathy or nephropathy <coughs> may be encountered in early cases of chronic kidney disease. But sure, those with end stage kidney immunology, if R drops a lot, there will be some form of sodium retention. This is why you observe that most patients are hypertensive, many are edematous, and when they are exposed to high salt load, they might easily develop pulmonary edema. So this sodium retention will lead to volume retention. But what do you expect about the natremia and osmolality in this patient? Do you expect them to be hypernatremic? or hyponatremic. If they are retaining sodium in their body. What's your answer? Hypo or hypo? Huh? Can you speak a bit higher? Hypo. Hyponatremia. Yes, this is quite right. Hyponatremia is more common than hypernatremia. Why? Although you are retaining sodium, because you are also retaining water, and water is available around you. So whenever you eat salt, you will feel thirsty. And there is also a disregulation of water excretion. So you retain water than retaining sodium. So you end up at having hypervolemia and hypo Natremia or hypoosmolality. This is common. But you might find occasional cases not like that. Occasional cases might have hypovolemia and the hypernatremia. If the, there is a strong nephrogenic diabetes syphilis. But bear in mind that sodium is related mainly to volume. But the complicating issue is the relation between natremia and osmolality and the effect of water transfer across the central brain. Our dialysis solution in dealing with the anesthetic kidney should be to address this problem. It should not transfer sodium a lot to your body, otherwise you will gain sodium and at best you will have hypervolemia by the end of the session. 
and also it should not contain more water than needed otherwise there will be transfer of high osmolality to your body and if you transfer high osmolality to the ECF then the cell will swell and you will have cell edema and one of these phenomenon actually can be translated as what we call a disequilibrium syndrome. There is imbalance between the concentration of certain molecules inside the brain cells and in the ECF. After you do a strong dialysis session to start with the patient not accustomed to have rapid removal of solutes from his blood or his ECF. So usually, the dialysis sodium concentration tends to be around the normal sodium. But we have a problem if you are dealing with a patient with severe hyponatremia. I mean, if the patient is going to dialysis with sodium like 110 or less, then there is a problem that there will be a rapid change of osmolality in this patient during the dialysis session. So we have to make sure that everything is not that fast and that quick. So this is an example of acetate formula when sodium is 138. And this is a bicarbonate formula. But don't be fooled by this sodium 105 because this still will be added to another uh, concentration of sodium containing nearly 35 millimole sodium. So the net sodium, after you uh, 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 complete the composition, will be 135 to 140 millimole per liter of sodium. And this is the final composition of bicarbonate dialysis when you add pu pure water to concentrated bicarbonate to the acid solution containing a little bit lower sodium, but the other part of the sodium comes from the concentrated bicarbonate, and then you end up by having a sodium which is not far from the prevailing ECF sodium in our body. But sometimes we can play around by uh, changing the composition of the dialysate regarding sodium. We can make it more concentrated, like 143, or less concentrated, like 133. So we can play around if this is needed. So what is expected of that? If we use low sodium dialysate, there might be intra-dialysis hypertension because the drop in serum osmolality as urea is removed is, uh, will lead to shift of water into the intracellular compartments that prevents adequate refilling of the intravascular space. This intracellular movement of water combined with removal of water by ultrafiltration will lead to contraction of the intravascular space and contribute to the development of hypertension. On the other way around, if we use high sodium in dialysate, we can minimize the development of hypoposmolality. So they might appear beneficial to start with. But the problem, if, if we use high sodium dialysate, we will increase the movement of sodium from dialysate to the patient and the patient will be thirsty and he will develop hyperkalemia after the session. So I treat the patient and I think I finished it, but at home the patient will come second day with acute pulmonary. So I have to be very moderate in playing with sodium concentration in the dialysis. And this just shows you what I've explained in the next but there have been some described indications and contraindications for use of sodium modeling, increasing or decreasing sodium program, like interdiated hypotension, like cramping, like initiation of new dialysis in setting of CP 
severe azotemia, like in hemodynamic instability, and contraindications like intradialytic development of hypertension, like large intradialysis with pain, and some cases of hypertension. So the fashion now is falling off using sodium remodeling or sodium modeling in the <coughs> patient. But still, some cases might be benefited with that, and you have got to determine which one. So the advantage of increasing sodium is to increase the hemodynamic instability, but this advantage is to increase risk, and you will end up by having weight gain. Decreasing sodium will cause reduced osmotic stresses and will cause hemodynamic instability. So there is a price to pay for any change. So please be moderate with that. Do I have more time or do I have to stop here? I I finished the important part of this. I think the audience are quite tired, so <coughs> Right, so uh, I'll just show you the symptoms and signs of hyponatremia because uh, this is quite important. The development and severity and signs of hyponatremia will depend on rate of decline, how severe the decline is, and also the age of the patient. And this is because the brain is the most sensitive tissue of the body of change osmolality. The osmolality inside the brain cells take time to accommodate any change in the ECF osmolality. And if the changes in the ECF osmolality or sodium concentration is too quick, then the brain starts to suffer and the patient will start to feel sick like that. Muscle cramps, we find this a lot in our diet patient, lethargy, sleep phenomenon, disorientation, agitation, decreased level of consciousness decrease deep tendon reflexes, pathological reflexes, kinescope respiration, hypothermia, pseudo palpar palsy, convulsions, and the core. Actually, only, the only thing that you can deal with easily is muscle cramps, but what's after that is quite serious. So when a patient on dialysis develops any of these manifestations, and you think of having hyponatremia like faulty dialysate composition, then you start to work energetically to improve that. The other system that is affected a lot is the GIT, when the patient starts having nausea and vomiting, and this occurs a lot also during dialysis. But also volume problem might produce similar manifestation actually. Not exactly, but might be similar. So, it is mandatory that every dialysis unit is linked to a lab that can quickly determine serum sodium and the potassium of the patient just in case there is a trouble. So you need to know and you need to adjust your dialysate composition every now and then to prevent this problem. I have to stop here, Yasser. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Nagy, for this philosophical presentation. And it's now open for discussion. Yes. Thank you, Professor, for your presentation. Yeah. So I got, a, I got a question. Actually, when you have, when you have a, a patient on, on that disease session and you present uh, hypertension. So, hypertension. Hypo. Hypertension. Hypertension. Yes. So usually, you, usually we, we put it on shoulder and position, and after that, I want I want to know if if we we, we, we usually shift the weight of surgeon in the in the machine. What we will do? What we should do to 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 make uh, up sodium or uh, down sodium to the machine. We have a discretion in the analytic hypertension. Yeah. Oh. So, but so we have sodium only. Not this, this. Speaking shortly, 
Before you go and try anything, try to know why the patient is broken. Yeah. It can be due to cardiovascular problem. Okay, but to now, due to volume problem. Leave it to right. Just, just to keep because we have Dr. Alan Man with us today and yeah. tomorrow. Thirty minutes about yeah. intradiabetic hypotension. Yeah. Yes, and if you have other questions in the sodium, no, 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 no. okay, please. So the best analysis is according to the patient's sodium. 
as Professor Nagy mentioned, if you have a patient with serum sodium, 130, this is a pre sodium, and you are, you usually are just on 140 dialysate sodium concentration. So, eventually, there is significant salt gain with its consequences. The last, the last point I want just to, uh, as a comment, if you have a patient with severe hyponatremia, if you have a patient with severe hyponatremia, serum sodium, if there is severe hyponatremia, sodium, for example, 110 millimol per liter per dialysis. How can I do a dialysis for this patient? Am I going to dialyze him against 140 dialysate sodium? Or what can I do? No, in this case you will use the lowest dialysate sodium, which uh, many machines wouldn't go beyond 125. And you use that and be short in time, don't do very efficient dialysis to start with. You might resort to daily dialysis actually, or sometimes even twice a day dialysis. But you use short sessions and use the lowest sodium until you get the sodium rising a bit better. Otherwise, this patient might be succumbing to osmotic problem when this rapid change of osmotic, the patient might develop uh, on time by So this is the wisdom of knowledge because if you, yeah, some, some people read in some literature that uranium is protective against demyelinating syndromes, but it's partial protection. And eventually, as Professor Nagy mentioned now, if you will be rushing in doing regular dialysis for this patient, he will suffer from demyelinating disorders. So, the, uh, according to what, what is published, the best and the optimum is to use slow continuous therapy. But it's not available everywhere and we don't have enough experience in many places. So, the wisdom is to do what Professor Nagy said, is to do short dialysis session, follow the lowest level of sodium dialysis as you can, and you can, uh, two hours or one and a half hour may be sufficient and to continue, as Professor Nagy mentioned, the next day or even twice a day, if there is, uh, and then by this way you gradually in, uh, deal with the patient because rapid rise of serum sodium is fatal in this situation because it will lead to the myelination. Do you have any question? Okay, thank you very much, Professor Yang, for this excellent presentation. Just, just an announcement. Just an announcement. Tomorrow morning, with a special workshop, we will start here, nine exactly, by uh, because our the aim of the, of the morning workshop is if there is an alternative, how to avoid dialysis. So. We will start with a presentation to prof uh, our prof Professor Ahmad Shukir about obstructive neuropathy. Because this is a way to deal with acute kidney injury if the patient has obstructive neuropathy to prevent MDSH kidney disease. Because it is potentially recovered. This is why I asked him to give us his ideas about how to, to manage and how to diagnose a case of obstructive neuropathy. And then it will be followed by my presentation how to retard the progression of any kidney disease to delay as we can the need for dialysis. And uh, lastly, in the morning, I'll give you just a snap uh, uh, on the how to prepare a patient for transplantation. And then I'll present a video for transplantation surgery. And after that, I'll give you a tour within the Egyptian Society for Forest Depression Academy, and everyone will be offered a gift, which is prestigious user and password forever for this site. Thank you very much. And we hope to be at the
at the lobby, at the lobby before 8 o'clock. The bus will move exactly 8 o'clock. Please don't be late. So take one hour and, uh, and uh, the bus will, collect, uh, will be ready there at the lobby before 8. So 8 to, to reach the dinner before 8.30. Thank you very much.